Hello and welcome to this presentation for ARP 2020. My name is Stephen Watt from AOC Archaeology and I'm here to talk to you about excavations at Aberdeen Art Gallery. Excavations across Aberdeen have added hugely to our knowledge and understanding of life and death during the medieval period. And many of these discoveries have been born out of developer-funded archaeological investigations, like the one at Aberdeen Art Gallery. A plan by the City of Aberdeen Council to redevelop the art gallery led to AOC Archaeology being appointed to undertake a watching brief on the groundworks associated with the development. It was that work that led to excavations in 2015 and 16, and subsequent post-excavation work that I would like to talk to you about today. Located in the city's School Hill area, the art gallery opened in 1885 and was designed by Alexander Marshall Mackenzie, and is said to be one of the loveliest Victorian galleries in the UK. With accommodation of industrial exhibitions and guests from wealthy locals, including Alexander MacDonald, a local granite merchant, the art gallery continued to grow. Eventually, the art gallery was extended to establish a plaster cast collection for art students from Gray's School of Art to practice from. Eventually, the Town Council took responsibility of the building and further development occurred in the 1920s, the city's War Memorial and Cowdery Hall. Further developments occurred in the 1960s with the James McBay Print Room and Art Library, opening as a tribute to the local artist. The Art Gallery, along with Robert Gordon College next door, is situated on the site of a Dominican Friary. The Dominicans, also known as Black Friars, were an order established in France in 1215 by the Spaniard St. Dominic. They aimed to live off the charity of those they ministered and became known as Americans or beggars. Part of the ethos was to also be self-sufficient. Their main aim was to tackle the spiritual needs of the growing cities that seemed to be rife with heresy. They had a strong affinity with the Virgin Mary, particularly seeing the Rosary as a route to salvation for others. Alexander II introduced the Order to Scotland in 1230 and established houses, most notably in Glasgow, Perth, Edinburgh, Stirling, Wigtown, and of course, Aberdeen, with another six across Scotland. In Europe, it became increasingly common for there to be women's houses attached to the Friaries, where they would pursue the so-called genteel pursuits, as well as intellectual activities such as reading and discussing pious literature. However, there appears to be no record of this being the case here. The Friary at School Hill was reported to be founded sometime between 1230 and 1249 on the northwestern most boundary of the borough. It remained here on the fringes until the Reformation. Alexander II is said to have bestowed his palace and gardens situated between School Hill, Blackfriar Street, Woman Hill, St Andrew Street and Harriet Street. It features regularly in documentary sources from the 14th century, however none of them are none from the friars themselves, and by 1503 housed a prior, 13 friars. The role within the community would range from acting as procurators in the courts, managing rents, but most visibly the role would have been burying the dead. On the 4th of January 1560, as with many ecclesiastical buildings across Scotland, a friary was torn down during the Reformation. After initial passing to the Crown and then to George Earl Marshall in 1587, following which he endowed the site to the new Marshall's College. The bounding wall, however, was still extant in 1661, and the friary was obviously still in local knowledge, as shown by Gordon's 1661 map. Beyond that, there were few details of the actual layout. The area around the art gallery has been subject to archaeological investigation over the years and cumulatively helped shed light on Aberdeen's medieval past. During ground leveling works in the 18th century, newspaper accounts stated that the walls, lead piping, and human remains were found, likely relating to the Priory. These finds indicated that the main complex and church was situated where the gym of the college is now sat along with church remains, evidence of a barn, kiln, dovecot, garden, and orchard were uncovered. Again, in the college, Cameron Archaeology recorded 29 burials during the watching brief of the new electricity substation. All the burials were on an east-west or east-northeast, west-southwest orientation, with 10 of them found to have evidence of being buried in wooden coffins. The earliest of these remains came back with dates of 941 to 1030 AD, while the remainder of those dated were sometime between the 13th to 15th century. Along the road at the Kirk of St Nicholas, excavations in 2006 by the City of Aberdeen Archaeological Unit revealed 939 burials and 3.5 metric tonnes of disarticulated material. The site also revealed the extensive redevelopment of the Kirk through its lifespan 
and the careful curation of disturbed remains. The extensive date range of the burials here gave insight into the changing socio-economic factors affecting the people of Aberdeen. Just at the end of the Upper Kirkgate lies Marshalls College, a once Franciscan friary where in 2009 seven older adults with their hands clasped together were excavated again by the City of Aberdeen Archaeological Unit. <coughs> it is most likely that these were former friars from the friary when it was still in use. Therefore, because of the rich archaeological setting, there was a requirement for all works to be monitored under watching brief conditions. <coughs> the redevelopment works included a new extension to the back of the building as well as a new stairwell and lift in the interior, along with some new drainage. This was conducted initially over a period of several months in 2015 and 16, and smaller phases of work up to 2018. The initial phases concentrated on the outside of the art gallery. In the October of 2015, during ground preparation works to the north of the building, a red brick structure underneath the step into the gallery was revealed. During machine excavation of the area, a large concrete slab with corrugated iron was lifted, revealing a mass of disarticulated human remains. It became immediately apparent that the remains had been reburied during the initial Victorian construction. The structure underneath was red brick, double skinned, and bonded with mortar. To the northwest southeast alignment, it had internal dimensions of 2.6 by 1.6 by 1 metre. Structure known as a charnel house, a building or vault that stores the remains found during grave digging. And it is most likely that the purpose built during the works uh, in order to accommodate the disturbed inhumations. The excavation of the charnel house involved a careful lifting of the remains and categorising on site for storage. During this process, three poorly preserved coffins were revealed. At each new stage of the excavation, we created a three-dimensional model to help show the relationship between each coffin. As you can see from the photos on screen, two of the coffins were stacked on top of the other, while the other was placed over a drainage pipe. Both of the lower coffins had been placed on brick pedestals for support. Our initial on-site estimate of the number of individuals housed in the charnel house was around 30, due to the number of skulls recovered from one of the lower coffins. Now obviously this was a very low end figure given that every inch of these coffins were filled with remains. In total some 3,650 fragments of bone were recovered from the charnel house. The charnel house and the coffins themselves will have been Victorian in date and of course come from around the time of the initial construction of the art gallery. Likely they were all purpose built or bought for the reinterment. Due to how poorly preserved the coffins were, full dimensions could not be fully determined. However, they were approximately 2.5 by 1.3 metres. They were constructed as expected with short planks creating the base and long planks binding. Unfortunately, the plank surfaces were so poorly degraded that no tool marking could be identified. However, they were likely rift sawn. The planks were tongue and groove joined and evidence with nails as well. The wood was identified as being Scots pine and spruce, and possibly suggests that there were two different coffin types used. Lace and textiles were recovered from the surviving sections of the coffin wood. Coffin lace, a term used to describe a strip of metalwork that was used as a method of fixing the fabric covering to the coffin. This was done in order to hide the corner fabric seams, and as part of the embellishment for the coffin. The earliest known date for this was in the 17th century, and it was used all the way up to the 20th. Other adornments to the Victorian coffins included iron handles such as side and end grips. These are all fairly commonplace within Victorian funerary practice and likely suggest the coffins used for reinterment were, uh, were pre-made on hand coffins in order to keep the original medieval burials in consecrated grounds. So far, most of the groundworks have pointed to the Victorian disruption of the earlier friary. However, there were still some prime locations that meant in situ burials were likely. Inside the art gallery, a new stairwell was to be built for access to the new galleries above. Through the excavation of around a half metre's worth of made ground deposit, we encountered our first burial. Buried into a compact gravel silt natural, 53 inhumations were recovered from a relatively small 16 by 5 metre excavation area. 
The inhumation is recovered, but varying preservation and is shown on the plan, various levels and overlapping with multiple other graves. Interpretation in the field suggested around four levels of burials, though this does not necessitate relative age of the burials between levels quite yet. Where we have concentrations of intercutting burials, we could have a family grave situation, much like as we still have today, or a path of least resistance. Regardless, due to the intercutting graves, graves preservation was understandably mixed at best. As typical for Christian burials, the graves were on a more or less east-west alignment in an extended supine position, with the head to the west. The arms and hands of the inhumations were arranged in a variety of positions, however typically laying over the pelvis area, either, across, either crossed or over the hips. In the case of one individual, the hands were crossed over the abdomen. To the east of this area, and still within the gallery, seven individuals were recovered in a six by three and a half metre area. As shown in the plan here, five of the seven had previously been, been truncated by the foundation works of the original gallery development. One was truncated by a later burial, where the last one, a juvenile, remained fully intact. Here the remains were in extremely poor condition, likely due to their truncation and relative position within the cemetery. From what little remained of these skeletons, it is likely that it follows a similar pattern and burial style as the other section. From both sections, we also recovered some 622 fragments of disarticulated remains. These were likely due to a variety of reasons, such as through the intercutting burials, as well as multiple centuries of constant development. The excavation is only part of the story, however. Subsequent post-excavation analysis of all the remains has allowed us to determine a variety of things about the burials at the art gallery. From the 16 humations and 4,272 fragments of disarticulated remains, a minimum total of 441 individuals were represented in the excavations. From the inhumations, a majority of the individuals were adults, with four juveniles present. Where sex could be determined, 26 were male or probable males, while six were females or probable females. The ages of ad adults varied, with three young adults, 18 middle adults, and six old adults. From all of the disarticulated remains, the charnel house, and those found around the inhumations, a total of 330 adults and 51 non-adults were represented. Where possible, of the disarticulated remains, sexually dimorphic features of the pelvis and cranium were noted. This produced a minimum of 55 males, or probable males, 26 females, or probable females, and again, were possible, the ages of those represented were found to be a minimum of 10 young adults, 39 middle adults, and 8 old adults. The individuals interred at the art gallery were of average height for the medieval period, with stature of males averaging at 1.68 metres, while the females were 1.57. Stature is usually a useful indicator of health during development, therefore, it seems that. Those interred here experienced conditions in keeping with the rest of the general population. A clear bias towards male burials was observed at the art gallery, perhaps reflecting the uses of Dominican friary. While lay people could be buried in the friary cemetery, it was usually reserved for resident friars. The proportion of females is, however, statistically lower than comparable with the Dominican sites. This may be due to the number of unsexed graves, or we may be seeing a deliberate zoning of inhumations. So far, the site appears to have been fairly long-lived in terms of use, with a small set of radiocarbon dates we do have, ranging from 1150 to 1670 AD. Our plan is to submit more radiocarbon dates for a further 30 individuals. Those dates combined with 15 already obtained should provide us with a detailed understanding of the chronology of the site. Isotope analysis is ongoing on the 32 individuals, but initial results have provided us with some very interesting information. Isotope analysis is an important tool for providing additional evidence for individual and population level dietary habits and movement histories. This is based on the presumption that food and water consumption during life leaves a specific signature on the body that can be traced back. Specifically, carbon and nitrogen isotope values can tell us diet during the last few years of life, or strontium isotope ratio can tell us where someone grew up. What we have observed so far is that the dietary trends seem to be consistent with other medieval sites in Aberdeen. We also see the trend that 
medieval Aberdonians seem to have a far higher marine diet than those in York, or even compared to individuals in the 14th century Winton Priory. While the remains in most cases were poorly preserved, osteological assessment has proven insightful in showing our individuals to have suffered a variety of pathologies across all remains. Dental disease were perhaps the most common, with frequent observation being deposits of mineralised plaque on the teeth, as well as lesions and dental abscesses. Gum recession was also noted on at least 20 of the inhumations. Multiple of the remains displayed congenital conditions, including at least one individual with spina bifida occulta. However, due to the fragmentary conditions of many of the remains, we may not be seeing the full scope. Six of the individuals displayed deposits of new bone in the maxillary sinuses, indicating chronic maxillary sinusitis. This has been associated with poor air quality and in medieval populations linked with industrial air pollution and poorly ventilated housing conditions. 14 individuals were found to have had traumatic skeletal injuries. Nine had one or more fractures ranging in severity. One of the individuals, SK60, showed signs of interpersonal violence from a depressed skull fracture in the frontal bone. Further strain on individuals in the form of small nodes caused by herniation of intervertebral discs were also noted. In general, the individuals at the Argali showed a variety of traumas and infections as well as joint and dental diseases, indicating a hard and arduous lifestyle. During the excavation, some artifactual evidence was recovered. However, due to the unfavourable conditions, some of the more slight artifacts proved easier to find during later post-excavation sample processing. Of course, the artifacts in general are not associated with Christian burials, and therefore the overall paucity is unsurprising. Artifacts recovered include clay tobacco wipes, dating to the 17th and 19th centuries, a silver billion penny of James II or early James III, and ceramic material. The ceramic assemblage includes redware floor tiles likely locally produced, with one in particular showing signs of substantial wear from footfall. It is possible that these fragments come from part of the medieval friary itself. There was also abundance of coffin nails recovered. While common practice during the medieval era, era, in some cases, would be to transport the body in a coffin and buried without. There are instances where individuals will have been, been buried with one. There's likely a small number of our individuals having been buried in coffins here. Again, personal ornamentation in a Christian burial is not standard practice. General, generally, burial practice in the 14th and 15th centuries involved the preparation of the corpse with some form of clothing or wrapping prior. Clothed burials are somewhat rare, however, with around 2-3% of people buried in clothing, while more commonly a shroud was used. Eight copper alloy artefacts were recovered from the art gallery excavations. This includes three needles, a buckle, a lace chap, a wire wound headed pin, a hook fragment and a chainmail link. Some of this can be considered as dress accessories. The pin was recovered from the leg area of one of the inhumations and is likely a shroud fasting, while the shroud was being stitched. Though rather than a purposeful act, this may have been an accidental loss. The buckle was retrieved from near the feet of a burial and is likely a fastening as part of the individual's clothing. Perhaps the most personal and intimate object recovered, however, was the small lignite bead, as shown on the left. This decorated bead recovered from the grave pit and containing three individuals is barrel shaped with an incised cross hatched down patterning and was framed with a series of incised horizontal bands at each end. Along one face, the decoration has been clearly smoothed and softened. Given the context and the wear, this bead has been interpreted as a rosary bead, rosaries being a memory aid and strung together in sets of ten, and are an important part of the Dominican order. These would have been common personal items, usually worn around the neck or wrist or attached to clothing. The wearer on the one face of the bead is quite possibly from the thumbing of the bead and counting of prayers. Everything I've mentioned so far gives us little ideas of the people that were interred at the Friary at School Hill. However, it could be easy to forget that these were real people with worries, regrets, hopes and dreams. And while we obviously cannot infer these archaeologically, we can perhaps shed some light on their lives, one way being through facial reconstruction. 
The slide here shows the process that was used to reconstruct one of the burial's facial features, created by forensic art artist Haley Fisher. After taking detailed photographs and measurements of the skull, Haley could work out how the muscles would have been attached. Once this has been worked out, she was able to overlay skin, and so we now have a connection to an actual person. We cannot determine all aspects, however, so facets such as the hair and eyes are down to interpretation. Skeleton 125, as is known, was recovered from the lowest level of the burials, with relative dating to around AD 1050 to 1410. He was an adult male over the age of 46, below average in height for the time, between 159 and 166 centimetres tall, and suffered from extensive dental disease. These included tooth loss, gum disease, cavities, and chronic abscesses. It would appear that Skeleton 125 suffered from a hard life and was showing the effects of age of de degenerative joint disease in the middle and lower back. He would have suffered stiffness in the neck due to compression fractures, fusion of the vertebrae, and had osteoarthritis. Isotope analysis has so far shown that 125 mainly lived off a diet of terrestrial animal. However, also substantial marine fish in later life. However, he consumed less marine protein than his contemporaries. Further strontium analysis indicates that Skeleton 1 to 5 likely did not grow up in the Aberdeen area. Instead, he likely spent his childhood in the Northwest Highlands or Outer Hebrides, and obviously spent his later life in the Aberdeen region. Skeleton 1 to 5 was our first real insight into the people that were buried here. He is offered as a fascinating glimpse of how widely spread medieval people were and allowed us to understand a bit more about their health and lifestyle. Life was clearly, and perhaps not unexpectedly, an arduous uh, one during this period. The excavations at Aberdeen Art Gallery has managed to add little more to the story of not only Aberdeen's story, but the monastery life in general. While it is likely that from the predominance of males here, there have been a bias towards possible friars being interred. Females and non-adults indicates that a wider lay community was also included. Perhaps we are missing divisions within the cemetery due to the previous developments. We are obviously still conducting our post-excavation programme, and while we have learned what has already been proved fascinating, there is still more to be gleaned. However, with more radiocarbon dates in particular, we can establish more in relation to aspects such as grave management. Isotope analysis will also give us further insight into how these individuals actually lived. So far, 1 to 5 has acted as our main connection to these people. He's managed to travel the world from the US, Iran and China in recent years. He's provided us an important connection to these people and a face that will not easily be forgotten. One small medieval man has helped bring life back to medieval Aberdeen. Thank you for listening. And if you'd like more information, please check our Twitter at AOC Archaeology or our website aocarchaeology.com.